media, politicians, and the older generations all too often portray young people as lazy, entitled, and apathetic, frankly wasted, whereas I think we have a wasted opportunity. I was a youngish councillor in Camden doing a lot of work with young people, and I seem to be having two parallel conversations. One was with the young people I was working with who were deeply committed to politics, who were full of energy and entrepreneurialism, and one was the media and political conversation that too often seemed to be talking about young people as a problem, much to their bemusement. Of course, there was a chance that all the apathetic, lazy and entitled young people just didn't live in Camden. So I decided to get up and go around the country and find out. And what I found completely changed the way I thought. I travelled some roads I hadn't travelled before. I learned a lot about One Direction. Um, I learned about Illuminati and what Kim Kardashian's uh, Instagram profiles really mean. Um, but I also learned about the passion, creativity and social change that young people are trying to bring about. I had some of the best political conversations I've ever had in the stairwells of estates and half-forgotten youth centres. And I finished deeply optimistic and desperate for change, like the young people I was speaking to. I found young people facing huge challenges, but I did not find a lost generation. The young people I met were highly ambitious, even where opportunities were sparse. This is a generation more concerned than ever with self-actualization, finding purpose through their work, and searching for personal liberation. But it's also a generation with very traditional aspirations. 95% of 18 to 30 year olds want to own their own home. Research by the Joseph Rantree Foundation talking to young people who have been brought up in workless families, found that they wanted to work just as much as their peers. The waste lies in the gap between these aspirations and the reality available to them. And I just wanted to look at uh, three themes. The first is that I found a generation that were fiercely protective of their individuality. I've lost count of a number of times young people said to me, I'm not my class, I'm not my religion, I'm not my race, I'm just me. They're one more generation away from majority organised religion and mass membership trade unions. Talking to young people, these concepts are hazy, like digging through someone else's memories. They want to be authors of their own destiny. As identity is no longer handed down to them, it becomes a project to be created. We see this in the rise of self-expressive politics through spoken word poetry, issue-based campaigns, blogging, and very personal expressions of politics and choices about how to consume and where to work. They're more entrepreneurial than any generation before them. If they want to write a book, they can self-publish. If they want to say something, they can create a video blog. And they're just as likely to volunteer and more likely to informally volunteer than older generations. Voting can seem a bit passive for a generation used to direct action. So this individualism can be a positive force. They want to make a positive impact. And as, as they want people to respect their individuality, they will respect others, and they're more socially liberal than previous generations. However, this individualism can have drawbacks. Many have bought into a British dream that if you work hard, you can make it. Success is an individual pursuit, and we pull much closer to the US than mainland Europe on this. But we don't live in a socially mobile society. For those young people who find barriers sitting in the way of those ambitions, this individualism can give way to a regressive force tearing away at community spirit. I remember sitting in the Welsh Valleys with a group of young people whose fathers and grandfathers had been very involved in trade union activism and had passed on that strong collective identity. And when I said to them, why can't you work together around some of these issues? They were like, what are you talking about? We'll all get together, we'll go down there, and there'll only be one job, and then we'll have to fight against each other again. So in a culture of me, when things go wrong, it can be deeply lonely and alienating. If you subscribe to an ideology of do-it-yourself, then too often the only person you have to blame when things go wrong is yourself. And so that's why we see some of that rise in depression and self-harm amongst young people. And in that youth culture that values choice and self-actualization, the ability to be able to express yourself becomes an equality issue. Which leads me on to the second big point that I wanted to raise, which is that I found a generation that was deeply divided in terms of opportunity. Most of us know that intergenerational inequity is an issue and that this generation has lost out when it comes to housing, when it comes to jobs and pensions. 
But layer on top of that, rising inequality, and you've got a much bigger problem. When we talk about the intergenerational distribution of wealth, we have to acknowledge that 10% of 55 to 64-year-olds have assets worth over 1.46 million, and a tenth less than 29,000. And that has huge significance for the opportunities for their children and grandchildren. It matters more than ever what kind of family you're born into. Not just how much money they have, but where they live, the premium they put on education, and the stability the family give you when dealing with what is essentially an unstable world. As inequality grows, for some, the world genuinely is their oyster, and for others, it restricts to the street they grew up on. I met young people who literally didn't go beyond their small postcode, who thought that 80% of people in the UK lived in poverty, because that is all they ever saw. And at the same time that it can be liberating, technology disrupts and polarizes. It's hollowing out the labor market, so we've got growth of professional jobs, which are going to a narrowing pool of young people, and we've got growth of low-paid options with little progression routes. And there are some communities that have just been left behind by technological change. There was a long-term structural problem of youth unemployment before the recession hit. But for young people like the 21-year-old I met in Birmingham, who'd applied for 300 jobs without ever hearing anything back, not even a rejection, this means a decline into depression, low self-esteem, but it also means a scarring effect for his life and a greater scar for society. So young people from disadvantaged backgrounds are losing out in education and employment, but also in terms of community and political life. We don't, we don't have the, the trade unions and the mass membership Labour Party that's representing them and that they're involved in. And I found that often the most creative and interesting ideas were coming from young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, but also the greatest anger. And they were sitting there saying to me, why aren't people more angry about what's happening to us? And it's the same thing that I was saying to my sister last Friday when I was with this case that I've been dealing with as a local councillor. I get a lot of casework, which was a young person who's homeless, whose tenuous housing situation had fallen apart. And I spent three or four hours on a Friday evening calling around every emergency helpline, numbers that I give out, desperately trying to find somewhere for him. And nobody even picked up the phone. And we have to ask, what's going wrong there? With my job, as well as the positives, I also hear some of the, the worst stories of youth violence. And what I always find is that there's a backstory of violence and neglect. A police officer told me a story once that really struck me, which is he'd arrested a young teenage boy who was very aggressive. And three days later, he got a call, a 999 call, and he walked into what was a horrific domestic violence case. And there was that same boy hiding under a table, looking at him like he was his saviour. And that's, I think, something really important for us to remember, that the, the same young people who are perpetrators are also victims. And I think we need to have some compassion for those teenagers who are, who are carrying that kind of trauma. And we need to offer them support because we can no longer afford to waste the potential on the scale that we are, if we ever could. And we're not delivering for those young people. Which leads me to my third point, which is this is not a generation who are finding the answers to the challenges they face in traditional institutions. In 2013, just 9.5% of 20 to 24 year olds were members of trade unions, despite, as we were talking about, the unemployment and low pay. They're deeply political, but they're not joining political parties. Only 15.8% identify with a political party, let alone join one. And I don't believe that this is a life cycle thing. I don't think that one day they're going to wake up and join in with institutions as they are. They don't necessarily subscribe to those collective identities. They don't want to be part of hierarchical organisations that will direct what, what they think. I think the worst thing for young people is the idea of a party line. It terrifies them. This really matters, and I think it matters because... For me, there are a lot of positives in our traditional institutions. I believe in democracy. I believe in collectivism. I even believe in political parties, which is unusual for my generation. But unless they radically change, they won't be able to survive because there'll be no one to hand the baton to. And I think we can't be complacent. Only 50% of young people believe that parliamentary institutions are essential for democracy. And why would they if they're not delivering for them? So what do we do about this? And I often think there is a nostalgia for the past in our political debate, whether it's on the left or the right. And me and my gran went to see The Spirit of 45 recently. And it's a deeply powerful moment 
1945 of shared endeavour and political spirit. But I wouldn't want to live in the 1940s because I wouldn't sacrifice the gains for women, I wouldn't sacrifice the progress on racial equality for that stronger sense of community. So I think the challenge for us is how do we create a modern spirit? What does the spirit of 2015 look like? And we can find it. We can find it in youth communities, which are optimistic, open, and respectful of diversity. Young people have been busy creating their own leaders as they've been dis disengaging from traditional ones. These leaders, they can find them on YouTube and other platforms. They live or die by their audience. They're responsive. They're in open dialogue. And they absolutely have to be authentic. Take MC Angel, who hosts Lyrically Challenged, which is a spoken word collective. And she says it's full of young people that bear their heart on the microphone. And I'm just going to quote her. It's a community where people can be open and raw and honest about who they are. We have like LGBT, we have disabled people, we have rude boys, hippies, everything at our events. It's a big collection of people together, united. To me, that's revolution, that's freedom. Or take Camilla Yahaya, who brought together 10,000 young people in Lewisham at just 16 around city safety, all starting with one-to-one -one relationships. And the youth movements that are successful, they invest in relationships, they're transparent about where decisions are made, they're open and democratic in structure, and they start with where young people are and respect their individuality. And they also hand over power. Take Rock the Vote, one of the world's most successful youth movements. They actually have a very small central team that coaches and supports young people. And rather than directing from the center, they let it go. And that's what really successful youth movements do. They trust young people and they let them go. And they're also deeply optimistic about the potential of young people. They don't tell them, get back in your box, take the first job that's offered to you, work long hours, try to squeeze some tiny bit of meaning into the two hours that you have not at work where you're exhausted. Because young people want to live entrepreneurial, meaningful and purposeful lives. And they still want to be able to afford somewhere to live. So rather than saying that they're entitled, is not the question, how can we deliver this for them? And that's what I find so powerful about the RSA's vision of a power to create which started with a speech by Matthew Taylor. It has at its heart the idea that all our young people have a potential to live full creative lives, not just a tiny elite. And this isn't something that politics can deliver alone. We need companies to actually work for communities and to offer the kind of purpose and autonomy young people are looking for. I think we need a radical devolution agenda that puts power in the hands of cities and local authorities, but down again to citizens and really lets, unlocks that social entrepreneurialism. We need public services that respect and empower professionals working in partnership with those they seek to serve. And we need to invest in cradle to career support for young people growing up in poverty. And if that all sounds a little bit naive and optimistic, well, I think that's okay because I think we need a little bit more naivety and a little bit more optimism in our politics. We've got so used to tolerating that high level of poverty and wasted potential, we kind of think it has to be like that, the price we pay for growth. And I don't think that's right. But I don't think we need to wait for someone at the centre to wave a magic wand and make this happen. We can all start. I have so many stories of young people through different groups, faith groups, community groups, who've just started and are doing things differently. And I think that those are the voices that we need to listen to. So as we look to the future, we're faced with two possible paths. The first, we could do nothing. We could go on as we are, thinking in the short term, relying on older volunteers to keep our institutions going, and paying lip service to the problem of youth disengagement. We'll watch more young people fall into long-term unemployment, beset by depression and ill health, unable to pass on a better future to their children. They'll be susceptible to the kind of movements that put forward a revolutionary, divisive agenda. And we'll watch our institutions slowly start to crumble away or just disappear. The alternative is to listen to them. Listen to their critique of our institutions. Listen to their anger, their alienation. But then listen again to their aspirations. We can do what the organisers of the Olympics did and put Inspire a Generation at the absolute heart of their mission. And it won't be easy... It will require redistribution of resources. But in doing so, I believe we'll unleash a torrent of energy and enthusiasm that can re-energise our institutions. And there are young people ready and waiting 
to take this on. Every time I've seen an organisation trust young people, what's come out of it has outweighed all expectations. So we've got a generation that, against all the odds, is full of optimism. And I don't think we can afford to waste that opportunity. Georgia, you've spoken at length about the creative new politics of yeah. young people, but you have worked within old school politics and you are a, a sort of a politician right in your bones. You mm. say you still believe in parties, you still believe in the system because you're working within the system. And my question to you is, why? If I think about, my, I'm a cabinet member for young people in Camden, so I have to make decisions about where resources are spent. And in, and in Camden, we've seen half our budget, uh, discretionary budget cut. So I'm making very, very difficult decisions all the time that really affect young people. And I think that matters. I think politics matters. I think at its best, it is linked to people, if we think about that history of political movements, linked to communities. And so when I was working with young people and I was hearing from them, actually, this is not delivering for us. We don't believe in it. I, I thought that's a problem. It's a problem for young people, but it's a huge problem for politics. So it's precisely because I do care about politics. And I do think that there is more than just issue-based politics, which is why I think that we need parties, that I started this whole journey in the first place. How do you convince the people that you're meeting and speaking with of that, though? Because they must feel very disenfranchised from the system. They must go into meetings with you thinking, well... These people, this, these elites, they're not going to do anything for me. They're not going to listen to me. You have to invest in relationships. When there's that level of distrust, young people just don't even want to listen. And I, I remember this one group I did, and we, I was saying, you know, if people kind of knocked on your door, what, what would you say? And no, I wouldn't, wouldn't even open the door. You know, we've lost the right to be heard in politics. And so I think that in order to change that, you have to go to where they are, you have to talk to them about the issues that they care about, and you have to keep turning up day after day. I mean, I, there's an organisation in Camden called Music and Change, which works with some of the most disenfranchised young people involved in gangs. And the girl who started it spent six months sitting in a cafe, turning up day after day, until those young people started to trust her and they started a, a relationship. So I think we just have to put the time in and we have to make it a priority. Mm -hmm.